Although many individuals nowadays label themselves as a hippie, despite the fact that they just seem to have rich parents and expensive tie-dye clothing, it's commonly agreed upon that the subculture pretty much died out in the early 70s, with much of what continued after that point consisting of blind nostalgia, tacky fancy dress, and an inability to accept reality. Don't let that fool you, however. During its peak of relevance in the 60s, the hippie movement was unlike anything else in history, with hundreds of thousands of unwashed and individuals flooding to hate Ashbury in San Francisco to spread peace, love, positivity, music, and of course, plenty of mind-bending sub the hippies became such a cultural force in America that the government and mainstream media were forced to demonise what they saw as a threat due to their inherent rejection of mainstream society. This came in the form of films that aimed to smear the public perception of hippies and even the criminalisation of some of their favourite pastimes. Despite this, the movement was still able to push through and create a significant impact on pop culture and society as a whole. But of course, what comes up must come down. And despite the fact that the hippie movement was such a powerful force, with an unmatched ability to create cultural change and scare the living out of boomers, it still had a downfall that can be seen as catastrophic, tragic, and inevitable. So before we look into the various events that led to the downfall of the subculture, we first need to define what a hippie actually is, as it seems the definition has become a bit muddy due to rich people continuing to burn incense and wear an abundance of beads on social media. Taking influence from the anti-materialism sentiment spread by previous counterculture groups like the Beatniks, the hippies would decide to introduce the idea of spiritual perfection which definitely wasn't inspired by. The term hippie would come from the words hip and hep, which in beatnik as well as black culture meant to be aware. Thus, hippie essentially just means to be aware of the movement. Despite this, many individuals during the subculture's height of popularity completely ignored much of the political or social sentiments, instead focusing entirely on the spiritual and pleasurable aspects, sorting to find more meaning in life through essentially and meditation. This would begin to shift in 1967, however, with the summer of love resulting in hippie movements popping up in every major US city, in turn forcing some members into more rural communes. This led to many within the subculture joining forces with political groups such as civil rights movements, Black Panthers, women's rights and anarchist groups, as well as individuals who had evaded the Vietnam War draft who were forced into self-sustaining communes. This in turn heavily aligned the hippies with anti-Vietnam War sentiment. In order to understand why the hippies were so opposed to the Vietnam War, we need to go back in time a little bit. The two world wars alongside the horrors that came along with that led to a generation of individuals who became disillusioned with America's supposed values. This worsened with the Great Depression, Cold War and a baby boom that led to the youth becoming further alienated. This inspired the anti-war sentiment of the hippies who had become fully opposed to traditional American values. Perhaps the most iconic hippie group that aligned themselves fully with politics and protest was the Diggers, and yes, that word begins with a D before any of you can try anything. The Diggers would form as an anarchist group in 1966, taking their name from a group of 1600s English peasants who would farm on common land to protest against wealth gaps. The Diggers of San Francisco would spend most of their time handing out free food to anyone who might need it, with a lot of the food being given to Vietnam War draft dodgers. They would become known for their street performances, with much of the group flooding the streets of San Francisco, using their performance as a form of protest. One of these performances was labelled as the Death of Hippie. The Diggers decided to host a mock funeral to signal the end of the Summer of Love. The Diggers would carry a coffin down the streets of Haight-Ashbury, where they would eventually burn newspapers and hippie clothing to protest against the rabid media coverage occurring at the time. The Diggers sought to end the commercialisation of the hippie lifestyle through this performance. Unfortunately, however, the hippies and their movement would not end entirely and would only go downhill from this date forward. By late 1967, homelessness and crime had begun to infest Hay ashbury driving any original residents away from the town. The hippies had reached their peak during the summer of love in 1967, with the following years just being a sad and slow decline. The movement had become so oversaturated, with any original message becoming blurred, leading to an overpopulation of individuals who didn't actually really agree with each other. The confusion continued with pretty much any group protesting anti-war throughout the United States at the time 
time being immediately associated with the hippies, which negatively affected both the hippies and contemporary anti-war groups. More serious groups saw the hippies as illegitimate due to their method of protest which often involved seemingly pleasurable things like music, sex, drugs, and nudity. One key method used by the hippies amongst other groups involved setting fire to their Vietnam War draft cards. This resulted in President Lyndon Johnson outlawing the activity, with a penalty of up to five years in jail. Despite this, protesters continued, resulting in multiple individuals going to jail, with the tension between protesters and authority beginning to build. This culminated in the key events that led to the death of the hippie movement in 1970, the Kent State shootings. But before we get to that, we need to briefly explore two events that occurred a year prior that had began to sour the perception of hippies in not only the eyes of the general public, but government and law enforcement. As described earlier, many of the hippie communes at the time were entirely self-sustaining, remaining completely separate from society, which does sound slightly cult-like. Well, if you thought that, you'd be entirely correct, as one of the most notorious cults of all time stemmed from the hippie movement. Well, not really, but kind of. Let me explain. On August 9th, cult leader Charles Manson would order four of his followers to break into the house of actress and model Sharon and Tate and murder everybody inside, later ordering the same members to continue the killing spree with the murder of Leno and Rosemary Bianca. Manson intended these killings to be the beginning of a plot to ignite a race war inspired by the Beatles song Helter Skelter, typical schizophrenic cult leadership. So what does this tragic event have to do with the hippie subculture? Well, despite the fact that Manson had no interest in the subculture as he had been behind bars for much of its lifespan, upon his release he was actually able to witness how it had been controlling youth culture and decided to tap into it, utilising aspects of the hippie movement, specifically their interest in anti-establishment ideologies, to attract followers to his commune, where he would isolate them from loved ones and partake in group trips, where Manson would take a significantly smaller dose in order to purposely mould and manipulate the vulnerable brains of his followers. This resulted in the Manson family donning a stereotypical hippie look, the long hair and clothing that was commonly worn by the subculture at the time. This successfully tricked the world into believing that Manson and his family followed the same ideas as the other hippies of the time, resulting in a widespread fear and panic against anyone who might have even resembled a hippie. This distaste towards hippies was further cemented in the mind of the general public later that same year with the Altamont Free concert disaster. Although Manson had damaged the reputation of the hippies beyond repair, the movement was still putting in an effort with festivals in hopes to replicate some of the success of Woodstock earlier that year. Unfortunately, just like Woodstock, many of these festivals were poorly planned out and organised. The worst of these would be the Altamont Free Festival held on December 6th, 1969. 300 thousand people would gather in California to attend the entirely free festival, which was set to be headlined by the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead. Due to lack of time, organisational skills, and no clear leader running the event, the stage area was amateurish, with little barriers between the performers and the crowd. They also decided to hire the Hells Angels to fill in for security due to lack of time, deciding to pay them with $500 worth of beer. When the show finally rolled around, this decision would immediately backfire, with the Hells Angels being extremely violent towards crowd members. The Angels had decided to utilise pool cues as a method to control the crowd, which only caused further tension within the venue. This even resulted in Jefferson Airplane singer Marty Ballin being knocked out by one of the Angels after attempting to break up a scuffle. The combination of violence alongside a mass psychosis caused by laced drugs within the festival would further escalate the tension between the crowd and the Angels. One incident led to crowd member Meredith Hunter becoming a victim of assault by a group of Angels. He would attempt to escape the attack and eventually pulled a gun on the group. This led to Meredith Hunter being stabbed to death by Hells Angels member Alan Passaro. This event completely erased any idea of the hippie movement being peaceful in the public eye, with the peace and love of Woodstock four months earlier being replaced by violence, psychosis and paranoia. These two events led to a 
further prevalence of vilification within the mainstream media, with exploitation films intended to profit off the movement, painting many hippies in an extremely bad light. This time period also saw the anti-war protests beginning to become increasingly violent due to the inauguration of Richard Nixon and expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. This created a rift between law enforcement and the hippies, who were being blamed for much of the protests. This would all culminate in an event that would put an end to the hippies and change the direction of culture forever, the Kent State shootings. April 30th, 1970 would see Richard Nixon announce the US Army's expansion into Cambodia as a part of the Vietnam War, resulting in a peaceful demonstration protesting this decision beginning on May 1st on Kent State University campus. The protest would begin with peaceful marches. Some individuals would decide to destroy copies of the Constitution as part of the protest. At the time, it was primarily students without the involvement of other anti-war groups. This would shift entirely later that same day when Nixon decided to publicly call the protesters a bunch of bums. This immediately sent the entire town into chaos, with protesters throwing beer bottles at police cars and storefronts before eventually reaching the campus and setting off bonfires. The police were able to disperse the crowd with tear gas. The protest would become more violent over the next couple of days, with city officials and local businesses beginning to hear rumours of violence from more radical anti-war groups. Other rumours included a plan to destroy the local post office, and another plan from the students, who were apparently planning to spike the local water supply with LA. This culminated with the city deciding to call the National Guard to the campus, who would arrive at 10pm. By this point, a campus building had already been set alight, resulting in another altercation between protesters and authority, leading to multiple arrests and injuries. Despite the location, it was later found that the majority of protesters were not students, instead consisting of more radical anti-war groups. Despite this, the tension between the students and law enforcement had reached a boiling point, resulting in the planned peaceful protest on May 4th, ending in disaster. Although university officials had attempted to ban the gathering due to the escalating violence, 2,000 students would still show up, with 300 gathering around the university's victory bell and the rest gathering on a nearby hill. The protest began quietly and peacefully, consisting of speeches and flag carrying. Despite the protest being entirely peaceful and lawful, the authority groups ordered the crowd to disperse. After witnessing the protesters continuously ignore them, the guardsmen were ordered to hit them with tear gas. This also failed to disperse the crowd, as the guardsmen didn't throw it far enough, resulting in all the gas being carried away by the wind. They were then ordered to advance, leading to a retreat of the protesters who had begun throwing rocks at the guardsmen. During their advance, the guardsmen had managed to split up the crowd and began to retreat back up the hill, where some protesters would begin to follow them. The guardsmen would suddenly turn around and without warning, began to fire at the crowd, resulting in the death of four students. When testifying their reason for firing, none of the guardsmen were able to agree, with many claiming they shot because they had heard others shoot. Many would also claim they feared for their lives due to the aggressive students, which was later suspected to be a reason fabricated by the guardsmen after the event occurred, as many who had claimed this were actually facing away from the crowd at the time, so had no way of telling whether they were in danger or not. After further threats, threats to shoot after the initial shooting, the crowd would disperse, where ambulances would rush to the scene. The campus shut down immediately after the shootings. No memorial service, no counselling, the students were just told to leave. This blatant display of violence towards the public affected the hippies in a way that was much different to the aftermath of Manson and Altamont. The Kent State shootings didn't kill the public perception of hippies, it warped many individuals within the scene into completely different subcultures and ideologies. The shooting changed the political and cultural landscape forever. Many individuals saw public protesting as extremely dangerous, with the peace and love promoted by most hippies being replaced with nihilism and a focus on rebellion through a new, raw, stripped-down genre of music, that of course being punk. The events at Kent State also affected music more directly, through a handful of future musicians being present at the university during the event. Future Devo founder Jerry Casale, 
was in the crowd during the shooting and went on to mention that the pioneering punk and new wave band likely wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the shooting. He even mentioned how he was a hippie before the shooting and after the fact any interest in that ideology completely dissolved. Devo, short for de-evolution, was a reflection of the backwards direction of society which can be highlighted by the events of Kent State. Joe Walsh would also drop out of Kent State after the tragic events, eventually joining the Eagles and going on to a successful solo career. Eventual Pretenders singer Chrissy Hind would also be present for the shooting and would eventually drop out, move to England and become a key member of UK's early punk rock scene. The Kent State shooting was the final nail in the coffin for the hippie subculture. Their public perception had already been tarnished by the actions of criminals and psychopaths, with any positive message being diluted by the negative public perception. Kent State removed any positivity the movement may have had. They no longer had the ability to dress and act the way in which they wanted in public without fear of violence taken against them. Culture began to see a shift, with much of the youth culture that followed focusing more so on aggression and angst than peace and love. Despite its fall from grace, the hippie subculture has still positively affected culture in plenty of ways, and although the death of the hippies can be attributed to a few events, it was honestly inevitable. Anything that causes that much noise and real positive change is only going to receive negative attention from individuals who see it as a threat. And let's be honest, the stench was probably getting a little bit ridiculous, so it was probably about time.